Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Pro. <laughs> I just love it when I start my shows off so well. <laughs> criminal profiler Pat Brown. And this is hangout number 124. I think my brain is already that um, I'm on a bit of a time crunch today because uh, I just joined a chorus. Um, not that I know if I can sing because I've never sung really in my life. But I decided to try something new because it's winter and I hate winter and I don't have plans to leave Maryland during winter. And so I try to add some in, things in to make life fun. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying this. So the the uh, chorus is at 2.30 on, on uh, Thursdays. And so I have to work out the schedule issues. But for this week, I was thinking of moving uh, the earlier show, the three o'clock show to Wednesday. But I just ran out of time on that too. So that's why Thursday, 12 p.m., and I have to be out of here in time to be able to drive over so I don't arrive late. Because if you do, you get in trouble <laughs> because it's a course. <laughs> they have all the rules. <clears throat> so anyway, yes. All right. So I'm just going to say hello to everybody without everybody's name. So glad you're all here. That will save me a little time. But hello, everybody. And uh, I do recognize all of you guys. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. And if you are new to the channel, uh, just rolling into this pa uh, patron chat number 124 and you'd like to be part of the chat room, uh, please do click the link below and you will see Patreon. You join Patreon. Uh, it's five bucks a month. You support this educational channel and you can come to eight different live shows a month and uh, be part of the community. So I welcome you to do that. Um, and uh, that helps the channel. If you don't want to do that, you can still see still see every one of my videos because every video is public. Um, after I finish the live part, it, all of my videos go public. Please just subscribe to the channel, like the videos, click your little bell for notifications, and check my playlist. Okay. So hello, everyone. Okay, so I want to open this up with a discussion which I think is important. Uh, and I hope it's some, maybe my last time discussing these things. Um, but as a profiler and an analyst and anybody here now a lot of you folks aren't going into profiling uh and you're not you're not becoming detectives uh but i think it's important for life in general but especially important for people who have to do analysis um that when we do analysis we do have to take our emotions and stick them over here we don't have to like the people we're analyzing we don't have to like the victim we don't have to really dislike the the killer, like just because he's whatever he is. Um, we don't have to dis we don't have to get our opinions of religion or politics or anything, medical situations, um uh into our brain so that we then when we're analyzing, we get angry at one side, you know, we we take this side because of our feelings, not because of the evidence. You can still have the same feelings, <laughs> even, but the evidence is the evidence. And so if you're doing analysis, you do have to step aside from that. Let me give you a simple example. Um, I homeschooled all three of my children. I had friends who thought I was wrong for homeschooling my kids. They thought I was keeping my children from society, that I was being controlling. My kids will probably I agree with that. <laughs> you know, like you, you know, you're, you're, you're not a good parent if you're going to keep your kids at home every day and you can't teach them as well as the many teachers in the schools and they need to socialize more. And everybody had good points. Now, this is the thing you have to be able to do when you're, you're analyzing anything to understand that the other side of where you're at might have also good points. I had good points. They had good points. Not one side is not 100% right. The other side's 100% wrong. Uh, so when people told me certain things, I evaluated their concerns and thought, all right, I, I, I can understand that concern. And for example, socialization is a big deal for people who you know, think homeschoolers are hiding their children in the houses because they don't want to, them to associate with children of, of different uh, cultures and different races. Well, in my house, we had a multiracial and multicultural family. So <laughs> that helped. Um, but that wasn't why I kept my kids out of school. But I understood their concern about that because there are homeschoolers who do this. There are homeschoolers who are abusers. Okay. Gypsy Rose Blanchard, her mother 
took didn't have Gypsy go to school. She homeschooled her. Actually, she just didn't. She did whatever she did with her, like watching a lot of movies. She used homeschooling as a way to control her child and keep the eyes of society off of her so she could continue to abuse her. So some people who homeschool are criminals. <laughs> some people who homeschool are psychopaths. And when I was I, when I was homeschooling my kids and I joined homeschool groups, there were a couple people I'm like, that one's kind of creepy. <laughs> so when I had friends or people, just people in general, who said, I don't agree with you. You know, I don't agree with their homeschooling. I think that's wrong. I didn't hate them. I didn't get mad at them because I understood they were coming from a perspective that had some legitimacy to it. But they also couldn't understand my perspective because they we were in two different two different mindsets, essentially. And maybe they never experienced what I experienced. And I've never experienced what they experienced. So we have these different mindsets. Um, so it's always valuable to just listen to the other side, if you want to call it a side, the same thing with politics or any any, any situation. There's a lot of gray areas in the world. And, and when you're in the gray, when you have some of these gray areas, the problem is people don't want to admit the gray areas exist. They do exist. And for this reason, I'm trying to get people to understand that when I analyze, there's always that gray area. So, of course, the worst I've ever taken a lot of hits on is the Maya Kowalski case, because the, the issue came down to people was like this. Over here, we have Maya, who people said, and let me get that. I always have trouble with it. CRPS. I tend to say CPRS. I don't know why. Okay, CRPS, and that is a neurological disorder. I'm going to read this, a complex regional pain syndrome. Now, the word syndrome is a clue. It's hard to diagnose because a syndrome is basically a set of, uh, it, it's a lot, um, it's one of these conditions which cannot be proven for, for the most part by scientific tests. It, it becomes down to, do you have these 10 behaviors? <laughs> do you have these 10 symptoms? Do you have these 10 things that bother you? And that's why we think you might have this. Uh, there's a number of different syndromes, which people have suffered with. They go to the doctors and over, the doctors don't believe them. They just say, eh, just making the crap up. Uh, you're, you know, you're hypochondriac. You know, people have suffered with actual dis, uh, debilitating physical issues that the doctors simply don't believe them because the doctors can't do the tests. All right. We have that issue of the gray air, grayish area that a person is making claims that this group can't prove. So, so now the question is, are all these claims 100% true? And are all these doctors 100% crappy? So this is where we get into this problem of the absolute sides. Um, and a lot of people said with, with what I said about the Maya Kowalski cases, well, you don't understand CRPS. She had CRPS for God's sakes and her mother was trying to help her. I never said that she didn't have CRPS. First of all, I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose, but it is a syndrome. I don't know. But I, what I do know is that she could very well have CRPS because here's something that's important to understand. Two conditions can exist at the same time. A, a person can have an actual disease, but they can also be Munchausen's. Mm -hmm. uh, a parent can have a child with an actual disease, but the mother can still be Munchausen's syndrome by proxy. Now, how does this work? All right. It works like this. Let's say a woman goes out on a date. She gets drunk with the guy she's with. He pulls her into his bedroom and she's kind of like drunk. You know what I mean? So he pulls her onto the bed and they start kissing. And then she's like, not too into what she's like, Oh, I'm really not into this dude. <laughs> so she tries to kind of pull back and he pulls her in and he kisses her some more and he starts removing her clothing and she's kind of drunk. So she's like, no, 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 no. Anyway, she finally says, no, don't do this. And he does that. So he has sex with her vaginal sex. Now, is that rape? Well, theoretically, yes. If she she said she didn't, if she didn't really say she didn't want, if she didn't 
it, it, this is where the gray area comes in. Did she not express it well enough or did she express it, but he was drunk and didn't listen? Who knows? But here's the point. So this happens. She goes to the police and she says, this guy raped me. All right. They, they do it. They do a test, uh, some tests, and they do find that there is semen inside her a vagina. So there was a sex act and she gives a story and the, the story seems reasonable enough. But then she says this, and then he beat me and he tied my hands to this poster bed and he sexually assaulted me uh, anally and he did it three times over. And then he used an object to also sexually assault me vaginally and anally. And now the story grows. And now the, the doctors are going, because now they're looking at evidence and they're going, eh, not really seeing this. <laughs> I don't see the evidence of an anal assault. I'm not really seeing an evidence that she was actually, I don't see any like marks on her wrists. Now they're confused. So did the rape occur? Well, it could have occurred, but did the other stuff even occur? So one could have occurred and the other stuff didn't occur, but she wanted to exaggerate it. So now you have these doctors in this dilemma. They're like, well, you know, we see something, but we don't know what we see. So this is the gray area. Um, so when you get a situation with a child, oh, let, let me go, let me go on with just Munchausen's. So I worked in the hospitals for 13 years as an interpreter. And one of my clients was very, very Munchausen-y. <laughs> And she would get pregnant a lot. And what she would do is she would come in and say she had contractions. I'm a, And she would groan. She'd roll around in pain and pain and pain. And they would put her on the monitor and they couldn't find any contractions. And then she would get angry. She'd say, well, I don't know what's wrong with your dang machine because I'm feeling horrific contractions. Was she pregnant? Well, yes, she was pregnant. She was like six months pregnant. She's clearly pregnant. Do pregnant women sometimes, uh, she would say, I'm, I, I've suffered, I'm, I've been bleeding. But when she got to the hospital, they couldn't prove she was bleeding. She would claim that she'd been bleeding. She would claim she had the contractions. She would claim this and she would claim that. And she was trying to get a, a C-section at six months. And she eventually, one time, she did have manage that. And her child then was born blind, deaf, and uh, um, intellectually disabled and lived for six months in a hospital for sick children and died. It was the time of her life because she was a psychopath who abused her children through Munchausen syndrome by proxy, that behavior to get to she, Munchausen syndrome for herself, essentially, not even Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Although, see, well, we have an overlap because she was claiming that things are happening in her had to do with the baby. You see how confusing it gets. But these, they should never have given that C-section, but they did. I think the, doc, the doctors were wrong. I, doing what they did. I think they killed that child. But they some some doctor fell for what she said. So you get this, this issue of, yes, she was, but then what about? Now, let me tell you another inter interesting situation. I'm going to call these people John and Jim. So John, the, both of these uh, young men were African-American men. And sickle cell anemia is, very, is, is a, a, a disease of African-American men. And it's very, very painful, horrifying disease that if people live with. Um, and so John and Jim both came to this, the hospitals and I worked at many different hospitals. So I saw them at different hospitals and they both came in in agonizing pain. And anybody who's ever had sickle cell, you know what I'm talking about. There, a lot of it's in, I can't remember, it's been a while, but in your back, a lot of back pain and it's just really bad. So what happens is when these men, these two men would come into the hospitals, they would be rolling and writhing on, on the stretcher. And then they'd be, go, they'd be in the room and I'd be interpreting for them. And, and they would be saying, I'm so out of pain. I'm, it's pain in my, my back. It's really bad. And, and, and they, would, they would be so struggling, you know, writhing. This is what's a sign for writhing. And eventually they would give them something um, like uh, Dilaudid was a common thing that, you know, you get an IV, you get Dilaudid. And then you leave with Percocet to control the pain. So we had John and Jim. Doctors gave John, did so, and they did so with Jim. <laughs> so, but there's a difference between John and Jim. <laughs> John and Jim were actually friends in a sort, sort of a way. John, when I interpreted for him and his, um, uh, and his uh, sickle cell, 
I saw the pain he went through. I saw I would be in the room with him and he was just suffering and suffering. And he was so thrilled when he got the Dilaudid because it lowered the pain. And, and every, you know, I felt so much for John. Um, nice guy. And then when I interpreted for Jim, Jim would be exhibiting the same symptoms as John rolling around. The doctor would walk out of the room and he'd jump up and go, so, hi, hey, hey, Pat, what's up? <laughs> how, how are the kids? I'm like, Jim was a fake. Jim was, <laughs> Jim faked it. As soon as the doctor rolled back in, that dude would throw himself back down on the, on the stretcher. Oh. <laughs> he liked a lot of it and he liked what he really wanted was a Percocet because he would sell it on the street. One day, one of the doctors said, I think Jim might be faking it. <laughs> yeah, you think? I was an interpreter. I wasn't allowed to say anything. I knew Jim was faking it for you for like, actually a couple of years before anybody figured it out. He would jump from hospital to hospital. So they didn't know. This is what the medical industry deals with is that a person may come in, not have a condition, but pretend they do. Or a person can come in. Let's say a person comes in and they do have some some actual true condition. I'm talking about Munchausen, not Munchausen syndrome by proxy. But let's say a, a woman comes in, which usually is females. Uh, a woman comes in and she has a diagnosis of some actual real disease, but then she adds on a whole bunch of other stuff to get more attention because she isn't getting enough attention from the disease. A child can have a condition like Maya. I believe. 100% Maya, I had to look down and look at those letters again. <laughs> I believe that Maya had CRPS. I don't disbelieve that at all. What I believe is that her mother wanted her, the mother did other things to exaggerate certain issues so she could get more attention, more control, and more power. She was a nurse herself, and she, I think she loved that whole thing. So when Maya got to the hospital, that's what her mother did. Um, and the doctors had to do due diligence. And because this is a syndrome, they didn't know this young kid, whether she really had CRPS or not. They had to do due diligence, but Beata immediately started to say, you got to give her this, you got to do this, you got to do this. They had to be suspicious. Now, so yes, a child can have a disease and the parent could actually... The, the disease is real, but the parent can still exaggerate the disease to get more out of it. They can request a feeding tube saying the child isn't eating when the child is actually eating. They could do that. They could ask for medicines that the child really shouldn't be having, but that they want them to have. There's all kinds of things Munchausen syndrome by proxy people do that is, is frightening. And the doctors are in a situation where, do I believe the mother or do I not believe the mother? Uh, and if it's a it's a situation where I have to do met, at least determine what's going on, I can't just believe the mother and just do what the mother says. That would be something I would get sued for. So it gets very confusing. And I want people to understand the confusion uh, because too often we jump to say, oh, this side is right and that side is right. Um, when And then, you know, the other thing is people are not necessarily always the most perfect people. I am not a fond person of the medical system myself. I don't go to doctors. <laughs> I worked in the system. I don't go to doctors. Um, I try to avoid them as much as possible they, because I don't like the way the whole insurance system works. But that's my opinion. But there are good doctors within the system. And there are doctors who are terrible doctors. And there are doctors who just have to feel like they have to do what the system says to survive. Um, and, and some people have great personalities and some have sucky personalities. So when my son had his bicycle accident, smashed his whole face and went to a coma and, and his whole face had to be rebuilt, including his eye socket, um, the plastic surgeon came in and I didn't like the dude. He was, he was cold. He was like, he had no sympathy, no empathy, no empathy for me as a mother. I was sitting there like crying my little eyes out because my little six-year-old son was laying there looking like an alien, you know, and then. He's talking about, oh, I'm going to do the surgery. It's going to be like a five-hour surgery, like it's nothing. And he's all excited about doing surgery on my son. And I'm sitting there thinking, you suck. <laughs> you, know, you suck. You don't have any empathy at all, which you didn't. But 
I realized that dude loves surgery. <laughs> and I'm like, do I want an empathetic surgeon who sucks at surgery? Or do I want a good surgeon who, who sucks at empathy? <laughs> Where do I want to go? I chose the, 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 I chose a surgeon with no no bedside skills. You know what I mean? I'm like, all I want you to do is look at my son's face. I don't care if you I don't care if you think it's fun, like you're 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 building a Lego project. I want my son's face fixed. And the last thing I need is a nice guy who can't do shit. So <laughs> there's all these sides. Not everybody who works in any industry is perfect. Teachers aren't perfect, profiles aren't perfect, doctors aren't perfect. They have all kinds of things. But when you come down to analyzing an issue, you have to understand it's not necessarily this side against this side because there's those gray areas. And then there's the, what does the evidence really tell us? And so I just rec I just say to you um, in this long speech <laughs> that when, you, when, when uh, one is analyzing crimes or analyzing different kinds of um, situations, which are very difficult, just understand that even if you don't agree with the person on the quote other side, they're not necessarily malicious and they're not necessarily wrong. They're just seeing things differently and maybe analyzing differently, or maybe they have different experiences. I just think that's really important. Um, I do want to say that the other thing before I go to some of your comments on this, and then I'll go to regular other regular crime stuff. Um, I also did a whole thing on the uh, the Nick um, go to John issue with a uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Now, originally when I did the Gypsy Road Blanchard thing, I got interesting sides again. Poor Gypsy and Gypsy is a psychopath. <laughs> Two sides. Gypsy, oh, poor Gypsy was, oh my God, Pat, you did the nicest letter to Gypsy. This side. Geez, your profile. Don't you see no a psychopath and you see one? <laughs> I didn't do the letter because to Gypsy Rose Blanchard. I think I'll link that below because I wasn't analyzing her at this point. What I did know is Gypsy Rose Blanchard was tortured for two decades, made a decision to have someone kill her mother, which was definitely wrong. But I can't analyze exactly because of the situation she'd been in for two decades, that her brain was in the right place for making proper decisions or that even she was even wrong because I think Dee Dee Blanchard would have killed Gypsy had she stayed in the house much longer. I do believe that. I believe that she would have run out of ways to use Gypsy for the doctor stuff and she, and gypsy starts fighting back she would finally say if i just get rid of her kill her i'm gonna get a great funeral people will feel sad for me i know the gofundme thing you know and uh, and and she can't fight back anymore so maybe gypsy really did feel she had to kill her but i you know that's a whole another whole thing and you can check all my videos on that but nick Godijan, who was the one who actually stabbed up uh dd 17 times we have the two sides again Poor Nick, the whole fan club, poor Nick, he, he's on the autism spectrum. He didn't, he was so madly in love with Gypsy that he did did her bidding and he shouldn't be in prison. The other side is, okay, that dude's scary. I'm on this side. All right. Why am I on this side? I examined the evidence and this is the side I prefer to be on. Um, and I believe, and this is something also very important. Remember what I just said about Maya Kowalski. She can have, really have a condition, but her mother can still be a psychopath exhibiting Munchausen syndrome by proxy. In Gypsy's case, she didn't have a condition and her mother made up a condition. But in Maya's case, I believe Maya did have the condition, needed proper treatment, but she had a mother who became problematic in the treatment because her mother exhibited Munchausen syndrome by proxy. That's my personal belief. Now we have Gypsy wanting her mom offed. We have Nick Godijan, who's willing to offer for Gypsy. And so, so people are like, well, he's on the autism spectrum. So he doesn't, he's the sweetest guy. He didn't realize what he was doing was wrong. Well, that's not what the evidence says. <laughs> because, and I will point this out, you can be on the autism spectrum and still be a psychopath. So here we go with the two things combined again. Very important to understand. Just, you know, everything is not one side or the other. Sometimes both sides can have points and sometimes they can be combined. So Nick Godijan, as far as I can see, may be on the autism spectrum. He's not, he, he speaks pretty well. I mean, and, and when you get away from the 
he did an interview when he was being interrogated. He was so he was sounded so so sweet and nice, and he was like going along with everything, being truthful, which he wasn't. He was lying still. But anyway, um, he comes across really sweet. But then when you watch the later video on him, you're like, eh, not as sweet anymore. Okay. And when you look at his history, his history is not sweet. He's into rape, murder, and torturing women. This is not sweet. Um, so can you be on the autism spectrum, have some Asperger's stuff, and still be a psychopath? And the thing, answer to that is absolutely. You know, what people diagnose you as gets really questionable, and sometimes you can have two issues at the same time. And I want to bring out this case because this is fascinating to me. Uh, somebody somebody told me about this case. Thank you, whoever it was. Can't remember now, but I'm glad you told me about this case. This dude, this guy is jaunty bravery. He threw a six-year-old off of a balcony, I guess. I'll read you the whole thing. At, at an art gallery. This guy. Look at his face. All right. Now, listen to this story because this shows you how everything is very much blurry, gray area. And so let's not just jump. Let's understand that maybe it's a little bit more vague than, or maybe the professionals haven't always been right in their determinations because professionals disagree. You go to one doctor and he says, you got this condition. The other doctor says you have a different one. You go to a dentist. He says, you need your, you need your teeth pulled out. And this guy says, oh my God, no. <laughs> go to a psychologist and say, you got this issue. And this psychologist says, you don't. That's the way the world works. All right. This is a, a teenager who threw a six-year-old boy from the Tate Modern, was not considered a risk to others at the time. <laughs> Despite previously assaulting police and a restaurant worker and hitting support staff with a brick, because I guess doing all those things doesn't make you a threat to society. All right. As Nick Godajan may... Okay, so he stabbed a woman he didn't know, except for one meeting, 17 times. And he had to work hard at it. Seven times, but he's not a threat to society. Okay. Jaunty bravery, uh, bravery, sorry. Jaunty bravery was 17 when he told supervisors he was going to visit a local shopping center in 2019, but instead he traveled to Central London Art Gallery, where after lying in wait, and this is interesting, lying in wait, this wasn't something that he just had no control over. He was lying in wait. He threw a young French tourist from the 10th story viewing platform. The child survived. I don't know how that is possible. The child survived, but has undergone round the clock treatment since while bravery, who told onlookers that social services were to blame for the incident. <laughs> you might be right about that. Again, sometimes other side is right. Um, is serving a 15, 15 year minimum prison sentence for attempted murder. A serious case review into bravery was seen by the PA media news agency highlights a series of violent incidents in the two years before, as well as other examples of troubling behaviors, including putting feces in his mother's makeup brushes and threatening to kill members of the public. Can you say psychopath? All right. Wait till you see how they diagnose this guy. But it is also concluded that bravery's violent behavior had reduced at the time of the attack when he was uh, living in a, in a placement with two to one care funded by somebody, somebody, some council and cl clinical commissioning group. So supposedly, even though he had put feces in his mother's, um, what was it? Put feces in his mother's makeup brushes because you know, all autistic people do that. Right. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things that happened when I did this whole thing on, uh, on uh, Nick Odejohn, I, 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 I got slammed so much with the Maya thing that I thought I was really going to get nailed by the fan club. And I thought people who were on the autism spectrum would be upset with me because I didn't let him off the hook for his autism. And do you know, 90% of the people who came on, came to my uh, video who, who are on the autism spectrum said, thank you very much. I really, we're really sick of saying this guy is representative of people who have Asperger's autism that, you know, that this guy who murders is like, oh, because we don't know any better. So I got actually a lot of support and I was like, well, didn't see that coming. <laughs> anyway, so they thought this guy had gotten better, you see, after he did these other things. Now, there was no recent evidence 
Now, here's the problem with recent evidence. When a person is a psychopath, they're a psychopath. They're, you know, things go like this depending on what's happening in their lives. So just because it didn't happen in the last year doesn't mean they're not capable of it. But there was no recent evidence that he presented a risk to other children or adults unknown to him. It was in this context that he was progressively given more freedoms, which saw him able to visit central London unaccompanied on the day of the incident. In other words, he got let out of his little prison, which was a, 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 a some kind of halfway house or whatever facility he was in being watched. But the review also found that while Bravery's case was characterized by, quote, appropriate efforts by professionals from across agencies to access assessment and treatment, lots of fancy words, for him, those efforts were, quote, stymied due to lack of services, placements, and provisions that were suitable for his needs as an autistic young person. Oh, see, he was diagnosed as autistic, but then listen to the next sentence, with a coexisting conduct disorder diagnosis. What is conduct disorder? It's another fancy term for psychopathy. <laughs> so basically, they did notice that he had psychopathic behaviors, but it was also autistic. So, yeah. Anyway, it makes seven findings, including <clears throat> a lack of residential treatment options for young people with high risk behaviors. And this is true. So where do you put these people? Emerging personality disorder. Emerging. That thing emerged when he was five. I don't know where you've been, but it emerged a long time ago. It was actually there. But you ignored it year after year after year after year. Call it emerging. And co uh, emerging personality disorder and coexisting autism. So again, yes, autism can exist, coexist with psychopathy. Autism does not cause psychopathy. Autism of any part of the spectrum does not cause murder and rape and wanting to have sex slaves like Nick Godijan wanted Gypsy to be his little sex slave. And, and he wanted to, and he wanted to abuse her in that sex slavery. That's not autism or on the spectrum. That is psychopathy. Anyway, so then they do a hmm, serious case review and they, they, he was diagnosed. This is so fascinating. He was diagnosed with autism at the age of five. I've always said psychopathy is evident by age five. Uh, and I say this without scientific proof. Okay. This is kind of my, when I've, when I've examined cases, I start seeing the behaviors of psychopathy earlier than five years old, two years old, three years old, four years old. In other words, something goes wrong, attachment disorder of some sort in babyhood, two years old, and the psychopathy has already developed in a kid that young. I've seen it with foster care cases, adoption cases, um, kids going to school and like wanting to poke other kids' eyes out with a pencil by the time they're in kindergarten. Psychopathy is already there. Okay, so he was not diagnosed with psychopathy at age five. He was diagnosed with autism. But there was a clear lack of join up between different elements of support that were being provided to him and his family. And he was not known to so ch children's social care or child and adolescents mental health services until more than a decade later. So somehow he didn't get that. But here's what gets interesting. Bravery, who was not diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder. Yet another term for psychopathy, because <laughs> psychologists love to have 10 different terms for the same thing, and they want to downplay it a little bit, make it sound sweeter and not so mean. It's like, nobody wants to say the word psychopath. Oh, he has a, he has a, he has a this, he has a that, he, you know, he's got some mm, antisocial tendencies. No, dude's psychopath. <laughs> but you don't want to say that because especially when it's a kid, because it's, it's mean. It's mean to say that about children. Anyway. Uh, so he wasn't diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder until he was arrested for the Tate Modern attack, spent various periods of his time being moved from psychiatric intensive care units, specialist residential schools and hotels from the age of 15 as his behavior became more troubling. A year before the Tate Modern attack, Bravery called the police to his flat, saying that he was thinking of killing people, during which he was assaulted, during which he assaulted an officer. The following month, he made two claims to support staff that he wanted to go out into the community so he could assault a member of the public and be put in prison. So this guy was, sometimes when you, you have psychopaths that are very clever and they conceal everything, and then you get some psychopaths like this who are very blatant. Um, 
And it could be because they do have a coexisting some level of autism spectrum thing going on so that they blurt out stuff that, generally speaking, other psychopaths would go, you shouldn't have said that, dude. <laughs> okay. Staff believed he was making these statements to provoke a reaction from the support worker. Review said it is evidence that professionals working with bravery at this time did not think he would act on these things. It was just attention-seeking behavior. So here we have the problem where a kid goes to school and he says, I'm going to kill everybody in the school. And everybody thinks, oh, you're just, you're just being silly. <laughs> and then the next day he comes back and goes, Arr! stop, stop, believe them. When they say that, believe them. All right. Now, here's the best statement of all. This was because all of Bravery's actions were viewed as products of his autistic behavior. And there was no consideration of these threats in context of conduct disorder psychopathy. They kept blaming every one of his behaviors on autism and none on psychopathy. And that's what the same thing with Nick Godajan is. They kept saying, oh, the reason he did this was because he's an autistic. And that's not true. That's not why any autistic person necessarily behaves or person on the scent, um, um, any Asperger people. No, that's psychopathy. You don't agree to kill your your girlfriend's mother and stab her 17 times and think it's pleasant and want to rape her because you're on the autism spectrum. No, that's your, that's the excuse you use or your defense attorney uses to make you feel that make people sympathetic towards you. You didn't know what you were doing. You had no idea what a bad thing you were doing, but of course you tried to cover it up and you lie to people about it. So you do know what bad thing you did. All right. So anyway, then it says here, <laughs> Uh, and the mismatch between bravery's needs and available provision ran through the whole of his case, so on and so forth. So, but that last statement, this was all because bravery's actions were viewed as products of his autistic behavior, and there was no consideration of these threats in contact, context of conduct disorder. And uh, I would say conduct disorder is usually psychopathy. They just have a fancy term. That's the problem. Um, so, so what I'm trying to tell you all in this uh, now 30 minute speech, because um, <laughs> I think it's important, is that we have even the even professionals disagree on things. Doctors disagree on things. Um, they label things in different ways. They're under different con conditions as to what they're required to do by society, what they're required to do by insurance companies. You know, and I don't always agree with they do. I've had run ins with with people and definitely in the medical institutions where well, I don't agree with what they do. And I know they're doing it just because the insurance system owns them. The insurance system owns the doctors and they don't want to lose their jobs. And they're told they have to do this. So there's, it's very, very complex. And I just want you to understand when you're analyzing anything, there's a lot of complexity in it. There's this side, there's this side, there's the gray area. These people have some good points. These people have some good points. And even as a profiler, I've had profilers totally disagree with my uh, final analysis of a crime or who did it. And as long as they point out their viewpoints and don't just look across the, the place and go, Pat Brown's an idiot. She doesn't have, <laughs> you know, and, and she's a moron and she does, she hasn't studied properly. She doesn't understand anything. She just did proper studies and she didn't, she, and they just insult me, you know, at hominem attack because that, that means that, you know, they're never saying that anything that I said had some value and some reasonableness for saying so. So I know people disagree with me with the Maya Kowalski case and some disagree with me with the uh, gypsy uh, Rose Blanchard and with Nick Godijan and a number of other cases. And that's okay. They have the right to have their viewpoints coming from their background, their experiences. But as a profiler, I also have my viewpoints. And then there's the gray area. And that's why courts are so difficult because when you go to the court, you've got the two sides and then you got the freaking gray area. And the freaking gray area is where it gets so difficult because sometimes these people are sort of right about some things and these people are sort of right about some things and these people are sort of wrong about some things and these people are sort of wrong about some things. This is the gray area. But we also need to accept the gray area exists and then we can coexist. Oh, I think I should put that in a, like, a, like, a, like a poster. <laughs> I'm going to go to your comments. I'm going to go to actual crime stories. But I just wanted to get that off my chest because I don't want to keep having to talk about it. Um, it, it it's, it's 
frustrating in, in many ways for me. And uh, anybody who's on YouTube constantly gets, you know, people with different viewpoints. Um, and it can be kind of brutal sometimes. But uh, these cases came all sort of kind of in a row. And um, normally speaking, I like to uh, analyze homicide cases that are just plain out homicide cases. Um, but things happen. And this, is, this came up and I spoke on it. And I just hope that I can clear up some things for people. And also, again, help you understand when you're doing analysis, you got to take emotions out as much as possible and, and your own view, personal viewpoints. As I point out over and over again, I'm not, and I'm not fond of the medical system. I generally, I have not been to a, a well, well check visit since 1990, over 30 years. I'm not fond of the dental system either. Also 30 years. Am I right? Other people go, oh my God, Pat, you should get in there. You got to get these tests done. You got to get your teeth, you know, whatever. I respect them. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I don't do it. <laughs> but I worked in the medical system too. I worked in the medical system for 13 years. And I loved a lot of the doctors and the nurses and the people in there. And they were doing good stuff in the emergency room. And I do love an emergency room because I'm like, generally speaking, when you come in on a stretcher and you're about to die, like I was from a tube of pregnancy, I was real happy to be shunted or shuffled right through there. They, they, they figured it, they knew right away what the problem was. They threw me in a surgery and they saved my life. I'm good with that. There are good doctors out there. There's good work out there. It's good work in the psychiatric field. It's good work in every field. And there's some you know, questionable stuff, the gray area. And some people just suck. Some people just are, are they just, they're just crap no matter what field they're in. <laughs> Okay, I gotta stop talking about this. I'm just gonna go down here. Ah, Reykjavik, you're in Reykjavik, huh? You're not near the uh, lava flow, I take it. So you're you're in the middle of the city, so you're safe. I'm <laughs> glad you're here, Harpa. Okay, I'm back and with saying hello to people. Let me go down to the bottom. Um, let me go to the bottom of some of the comments, and I'm gonna go to some of the other stories that people ask me to do, and I'm like, wherever I'm at. <laughs> I'm not fond of insurance companies. Very powerful. And the, the insurance companies, unfortunately, control a lot of what happens in the medical system, that a lot of times the, the doctors do stuff that is totally unnecessary. But if they don't do it, the insurance system will either kill them or, uh, well, they'll get sued shitless. So let's say you go in and you've got some condition and the, the doctor decides to do 10 different tests. I've done this when I'm interpreting. I've been sitting there. Doctor comes in, the person explains all their problems, and the doctor says, okay, we're going to do a blood test, we're going to do an x-ray, we're going to do a CT, we're going to do this and this and this and that. And I'm sitting there going, I already know what's wrong with this dude. <laughs> I already know. Guy's got a kidney stone or whatever it is. I'm like, I already know because I've seen the behaviors, I've seen the symptoms, and I've worked in hospitals for so long, like a fly on the wall because I'm with the patient a whole time. Now, I don't run in and out of rooms. I was with the patient tw like 12 hours straight, 14 hours straight, 24 hours straight. And I could, I could diagnose an awful lot of patients really quickly, but the doctors would take them through, which made me a lot of money because I take, take them through hours and hours of testing and waiting for test results and then going to the next test, all because the insurance company required that they do every single, cross every T, dot every I. So A, the hospital didn't get sued for not doing a test and saying they had a condition that was could have been proven to be not true with another test. And it becomes a nightmare. So sometimes the doctors, maybe they met, doctor may have walked in and said, I know exactly what's wrong with them, but now I got to do 10, 10 different tests. Is, it the, is the doctor bad? Is the system bad? Or should they do all these tests to make sure that they're right? Yeah, you see, there we got the, the, the gray area that comes in there. You know, it just sucks, man. Um, um, that's a good point. Uh, it's usually the opposite with autistic people. They can feel empathy, but have a hard time showing it. Yeah. But uh, so a hard time showing it wouldn't be stabbing somebody 17 times. <laughs> you know, that's probably not what's happening here. Um, Molly says, this is very interesting, Pat. Autism with empathy that seems sincere coupled with psychopathy all in the same person. So the psychopath who happens to have autism is mimicking empathy. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Because I just read this new thing. And let me, when I talk about labels and people coming up with new, whatever they come up with, I read this, this came in. Five signs you're dating a dark empath. 
and why they're harder to spot than a narcissist. And I'm like, what the hell is a dark empath? <laughs> you know, I'm a profile. I've never heard of that. You know, okay. Dark empaths have personality traits, including narcissism, psychopathy, and uh, Machiavellianism. Okay. I didn't pronounce that right. Ma 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 Machiavellianism. Is that right? Machiavelli? Machiavellianism. All right. They, it says, but they also have empathy, which can make them dangerous and hard to spot. Dark empaths intellectually understand people's feelings and therefore they can manipulate those feelings. All right. I'm not going to get heavily into the dark empath thing here, but this is, they say, this is a, a personality type that psychologists, I don't know who the psychologists are. Oh, yeah, let me, let me see. The term dark empath was coined by researchers in 2021. So this is new. It's two years old. I didn't get it on my Google feed till today. <laughs> Describe people who rank high in dark triad, dark triad personality traits, dark triad. This new dark thing is, is new to me. Uh, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism, and high in empathy. But they're not, the whole point, the joke of it here is they're not really high in empathy. They're high in knowing they should have empathy. Okay. So they express empathy, but don't emotionally connect you. And I think this is really, really important. So maybe I'm not so anti this dark empath thing. Um, you know, sometimes we look for a new way to explain something and this might work. Um, so a psychopath, and I believe Nick Godajan is one, he lied to get himself, you know, on the Christian dating site. And he found this pitiful young woman who had never really been out of her house hardly ever who had no social life, who had never really dated, who was a, theoretically a virgin and had problems with mommy. Now, we all know that Gypsy Rose Blanchard asked Nick to kill her mother. She admits that. That's not an issue. However, was he truly empathetic toward Gypsy's issue with her mother, the suffering she had under, undergone? Or was he a dark empath saying, I know if I sympathize and empathize with her, that will suck her in. Then I can control her and I can make her my sex slave. I think that's exactly what Nick did. Dark empath. So it, it, so they understand empathy. They just don't actually have empathy. They're just good manipulators, a con artist that, so this is the guy, they say this, um, uh, extremely good at love bombing. So they know what you need. So suddenly this guy comes along and he's like, Pat Brown, I know I watched your channel and oh my God, you're just, you're just the best profiler ever. <laughs> really? You think so? That's great. You know? And you know, I love animals. And um, he's like, you know, I love animals. One of the things you'll notice is that a lot, the, the, the clever ones will mirror, will mirror you. So they will suddenly love everything you freaking love. And I mean, who doesn't want somebody who likes what they like? I want somebody to come into my house and say, Pat, oh my God, you do such great art from never having done art in your life. <laughs> yeah, I did put one of my pictures up. Okay. Anyway, pastel, cashmere. Anyway, yes, do I want that? Because I had this fellow I was, I'm not really dating. It was a friend who wanted to date. And then he came to my house. And one of the things he did was never acknowledge any of my artwork on my walls. I think it didn't matter to him because he had no interest in it. And part of me was like, you know, do I want to be with a guy who doesn't even recognize what I do as a, as a hobby that I'm enjoying something? He can't like, like, enjoy, like say, Hey, you know, this is really cool. What'd you do that? He doesn't have to be an artist. He doesn't have to go like Gaga. He doesn't have to say I'm like the next, you know, uh, grandma Moses or anything. And it's, it would just be nice that he recognizes I enjoy doing you know, artwork and that he likes some of my artwork. But he wasn't too good at that. So I guess he's not a love bomber. <laughs> but if I'd found a love bomber, that guy would be all over my the best profiler. Oh my God, I just love your, your artwork. Do you want to go to the zoo? Do you do you want to go and see animals? Do you want to go see? Oh my God. You know, how cool is that? He likes everything I like, even if he doesn't like any of that crap. He's just lying about it. <laughs> but he's going to make me feel like he likes everything I like. And that's how you love bomb. And because you have the concept that the person wants you to do that. Oh, here's another one. They perfectly align with their political views. So suddenly, whoever you vote for, they voted for. Mm -hmm. um, they have narcissistic, narcissistic tendencies, which is obvious. 
they really try to improve. So yeah, they 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 themselves are going to stay flatlined right where they're at. They're not going to do anything. Um, uh, that's the end of this article. But I kind of like it. I kind of like the dark empath thing, um, which I never heard of. But that is why I think Nick is. And I think people mistake autism for manipulation. They're all like, oh, Gypsy is such a manipulator. And she might manipulate, but that dude is a manipulator too. And I think he took advantage of a person who was very, very needy. Very needy. Now, was he needy? Now, she wanted love. She wanted freedom. She wanted she wanted the fantasy. Mm, uh, she wanted the, the, night, uh, the knight in shining armor type of thing, right? He wanted a sex life. That's all he really wanted. I don't care what anybody else says. That dude was so into violent porn. He wanted a sex slave and he was having trouble getting because he's really basically an incel sitting in his room playing fantasy games and looking at porn. He was an incel and he finds this girl who's like really naive as crap and he's teaching her to be his slave. That's a sick son of a bitch, but he's also empathizing with her. But we can have again, there could be different viewpoints in a gray area, but I'm going to say Nick was may have been on the spectrum, but I do was a psychopath. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Um, thank you. I'm glad to hear that, Taylor. I am a therapist who work with several clients diagnosed with autism. They're very capable of empathy. I do and do not have any psychopathic behaviors. I think it's hard and horrific to, to just go there and say, because a person commit has, uh, is on the spectrum that they automatically didn't know what they were doing and, and killing is a pretty okay thing. You know, they didn't realize what, you know, like all people on the spectrum, just might one day just stab you to death. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, and that's also true. Some people with autism are very smart. Uh, yeah. And, and a lot of times it comes down to the educational system. As I pointed out in one of my videos that my, my husband, uh, my ex-husband, who I married to for 25 years, when he came from Jamaica, he, he, he wasn't, he was working in a mail room and didn't seem to have many, he, he was trying to figure out what to do with his life. And I took him to a, a specialist and he took an IQ test and he came up with, I think 70 or something. And they told me that he was intellectually disabled and, and, um, and at the time the term was mentally retarded. Well, somebody just got all pissed off that I even used that term, but he was, he was literally labeled mentally retarded 25 years ago. Cause I worked for the association for retarded citizens. So that was a, not a no, a bad thing at the time. But it is now. Anyway, he was labeled that. And I'm like, this is my fiance. <laughs> now, if I were also perhaps intellectually disabled or whatever, then it might be an appropriate marriage. But I was a college graduate and I was from a fairly well off family. And I was, you know, you know who I am. Um, why don't, would I be marrying a guy who is to that level of uh, intellectual disability? Much as it's okay, I don't have a problem with disabilities, but that would be kind of a weird thing to have that much of a difference. And I and I thought you're just doing bad testing, because because I've been around people who because I worked with Ark, I know what people who live who are in special homes with Ark act like. They don't act like this. Now he may be lacking in education, and that's what the issue was. He grew up in the mountains, and he just he hardly went to school, and came to the U.S. went to a crappy school. And then he graduated without much reading and writing ability, but he learned to read and write. And now he makes over six figures and uh, he uh, works on, uh, he's worked for the Siemens medical systems for years and he fixes MM, uh, MM, uh, 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 CAT scan machines and MMRs. Um, and uh, he does all these machines. So I'm going to say this, if my, uh, my ex-husband was intellectually uh, had some disability, don't get any of those machines because he fixed them. <laughs> You know, but no, there was nothing ever wrong with them except for a lack of education. That was it. And so, so a lot of times we give in some of the autism things. It could be an educational issue. It could be uh, when people say they have uh, learning disabilities. I've also experienced that. Um, like, like I have a son who, when I adopted him, he, his math sucked. He read, he read well, but his math was terrible. Do you know today he makes great money? He's a great guy. He's a perfectly normal happy citizen with a, I think a perfectly high IQ, his math still sucks. He's just not into math. <laughs> you know, you can't base everything on that. So we have a lot of testing things and, and methodologies, which we do things. We, we take behaviors as a evidence of, 
of uh, or, or knowledge is an evidence of, of IQ or disorders. We, it's a big fat mess. So, yeah, just because you were in a special ed class doesn't mean what does it mean? It means you needed some special education. Doesn't mean necessarily that you had A, B, C, D, or E or any weird combination. So, yeah, I mean, it's just some of this is just. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I'm Melissa. I've experienced, I've made to feel like a complete idiot when presenting what was going on to the doctor. And in the end, it turned out it was right. That is also true. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. And that needs to be something uh, addressed in the, in, the, in, the, in the medical institutions. That when a person comes in, they often, especially females, especially older females, I come in now and I, I am looked at as a, quote, senior citizen. Like, I, like I'm just, and they want to call me honey. It's like, like I don't understand things. Like I'm, like I'm just, I'm, I'm hypochondriac. I'm getting older, and I just don't understand how things work. And my brain doesn't work as well anymore. So therefore, I don't understand what they're saying. I mean, that's why I don't go to doctors <laughs> unless I absolutely know. I, I just, I just go to India and buy drugs over the counter. But anyway, <laughs> like Zithrom, Zithromax, because if I ever need uh, antibiotic, I already bought it in India, but for a buck. So. But that, you know, it's a frustrating thing because the doctor has their their viewpoint of their patients and some of their viewpoint, having worked in the medical system, is not entirely inaccurate as well. I have interpreted for some older people that were my age who did have the issue of not understanding things. It could be early dementia. It could simply be the fact that they don't, they're not connected to the Internet as well. There's all kinds of reasons. So I've seen it from their doctor's point of view, too. I just don't like being in the patient side of it. So you see, that's the gray area. And that's where we start getting all feisty about, well, <laughs> this is the way things work. Nah, a lot of times it doesn't um, work that way at all. Um, let's see. Um, so anyway, let me go on to... Uh, uh, okay, where are we at? We got to check my time. Okay, I got 45 minutes. All right, if you can put up with me for 45. Let me tell you some other just fun. Oh, somebody wanted me to talk about this. So since they asked me for this, I want to talk about it. Um, let's, get out, let's get out of this. I, I, I don't want to over talk about that, but, you know, it is a hangout, so that's why I'm doing it. But really, that's not my preference. But anyway, I thought that one about this guy was fascinating, though. That was a great article. So whoever sent that to me, thank you. So now I'm going to talk about this guy, Chet Baker. I was asked to look at Ch the, the death of Ch Chet Baker, who I'd never freaking heard of. Uh, he is a jazz musician. Um, and then I, I, I listened to him and I'm like, oh, how did I not know this guy existed? And there's a, there's a, there is a, uh, who is in this one? I forgot who was in this one. Famous art, famous actor, Born to be Blue. And this is a, a, a really, I want to see the whole um the whole movie on this one. It just looks like it's really good. So I'm going to watch Born to be Blue. It's all about Chet Baker and his life. Um, and whoever was in it does a really good job. And he's a well-known person, which I can't remember. Anyway, so anyway, Chet Baker is um, this uh, famous jazz. Well, he was a famous jazz musician, but a lot of people just don't know he existed, which I didn't either. He, in 1988, it says here, the tragic death of Chet Baker. Um, and this happened in Amsterdam. The anonymous body lay in an Amsterdam morgue after police officers had discovered the dead man on the sidewalk outside of a hotel near the city's infamous red light district. It wasn't until the next day when somebody identified the corpse that the world learned that the famous jazz trumpeter, and he can also sing, and singer, Chet Baker, had died about 3.10 a.m. on May 13, 1988, after plunging from a hotel window. Uh, the Amsterdam police determined Baker had fallen from the third floor window of his hotel room. And he landed on this thing, you know, it was, like, it was like a park, you know, like a don't park thing, but it was in cement. So there were like these two don't park things in cement and his head hit one of the cement things. Okay. Um, they were initially unclear as to whether it had been an accident, perhaps drug induced because he was a major drug addict, big into heroin and a whole bunch of other crap um, uh, or death by suicide. So they thought maybe he pitched himself out the window. And in, the, in this in this show, um, one of the interesting things um, they had, 
I think it was in this one. They had three different versions of how he died. One was he was he, he was sitting on the window and he just leaned back and said, screw it all, fell out the window. And, and the, the next one was he's sitting, just sitting in the window, just, you know, daydreaming and probably drugged up. He was drugged up and just sitting in the window and he just fell out by accident. The third one was some guy came into his room with a key because the, the room was locked, locked. Okay. The room was locked. So the, so the third thing, a guy came in somehow with a key and said, Hey, Chet. And Chet didn't respond. Chet was sitting in the window. So he started going through Chet's suitcase, finding some money. Chet goes, huh? And he goes, Oh, and he accidentally knocks Chet out, Chet out the window. <laughs> That's the third version. Um, but so it says here, um, they thought it was death by suicide or an accident, drug induced, either one. All we know is that there was no criminal activity involved. But there are others, including Baker's widow, who believed he'd been pushed uh, and said it wasn't a suicide. It was foul play. And uh, because he also was saying that people were after him. OK, so the question is, what do I think? I don't think anybody was after him there. Now, he had been attacked, mind you, by people over drug deal before, but that was in San Francisco. So. When you live someplace and, you know, you are interacting on a regular basis with people that you're buying drugs from and that you're, in, you know, things aren't, maybe you're not paying properly, or, you know, whatever, you can get beaten up by them. But he's on a tour and he's in Amsterdam. I just think it would be kind of odd that at that moment in time, some bad, bad, bad guys who are totally unknown popped up and decided to chuck him out a window. No sign of a fight. He, def he definitely went out the window because I, 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 well, I'm guessing here that some people might say, well, he was walking on the street and somebody beat him up and then it looked like he hit his head on those cone things, those cement cones. I, I, I believe they actually had enough information to know that he fell off the dang window. Now, some people say, well, there's only 10 inches. He couldn't get the windows open. I saw that someplace. I'm like, well, if that's true, no, he couldn't have gone out the window at all. So that's, I don't even understand that. There's some who say that he wasn't actually trying to fall out the window that he'd raised the window. Uh, how was this? That he was in the next room over and he was trying to you know, walk, you know, go across from, they said one balcony to another, but there weren't any balconies. So that didn't really make sense. Or it was so close. He thought he could go out one window and get around to the other trying to, you know, you see this sometimes on cruise ships um, for some reason, can't get into your room with your key. So you try to go to the, you're in the next room and you try to crawl over. I don't think any of that makes any sense. Um, so I think the window was open enough for him to A, fall out, or B, toss himself out. Um, third story. Enough of a fall that you could theoretically get killed. It's also not enough of a fall that, personally, if I'm going to commit suicide, the third story window does not inspire me. <laughs> I'm going to go off the tall building because I want to know that I go 20 stories down, I'm done. Third, third, third story, you know, how much, how much of your body are you just going to mess up and, 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 and be in a horrible situation? It's not really a good suicide jump. In my opinion, um, I am much more likely to believe that he had the window open and he's under the influence of drugs and he wants the fresh air and he goes and sits in the window and he falls out accidental or he was reaching for something that wasn't there and he went down and whacked his head on the cone. Uh, that's what I believe happened. I, oh, that hurt. <laughs> I got to, oh, shouldn't have done that so hard. Um, accidents happen a lot more than we think they do. And, and you know, it's funny because um, if you actually look at your own life and think of the silly little accidents you've had and you think to yourself, well, how, how could that dumb thing happen? <laughs> the dumb thing happened because we do dumb things, because we're careless at a moment in time. Now, I have from my computer here, from my laptop, I have connected into the Internet, right? So I have this wire that goes across the room. Do you know how many times I said, make sure you don't leave the wire there because one day you're going to trip on that sucker? And I, and I also tell myself, if it is connected, Walk slowly, make sure you step on top of the wire, make sure you don't screw up. The other day, I was rushing to see my granddaughter, I ran over to the couch, and I went down, slammed into the ground. And I'm like, all the time I've told myself, 
don't do that. And I did that. Luckily, for whatever reasons, I fall really well, generally speaking, and I hit the ground and I just got up again and went, I didn't have any bruises or anything. Go figure. But people do dumb stuff, especially under the influence of alcohol, influence of drugs. I believe it was an accidental death. And it's one of these things where people don't like to admit the person they cared about did something stupid and and ended their life maybe 20 years earlier than they should have. Um, and, you know, he had he had talent. And yes, he was a mess, but he had talent and um, people liked him. And it's a shame. And, but I will say this. Thank you for for telling me who told me that. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad you did, because now I'm going to um, Craig. No, 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 not him. Um, who, Chris, Chris, Chris Ravilla. Yes. He said he listened to a lot of West Coast jazz back in college. And I never heard of this guy. So I'm going to watch that movie. I'll um, just. Pay, yeah, this is the name of the movie. I don't know where it's at. I don't know if it's at um, Netflix or or um, I don't think there's a full full version of it on YouTube. But you might check uh, Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime. I'm going to look at that because it, it looks like a really good movie. And now I want to tell you who was in it because it was so good. What was the name of it? Um, uh, and you're going to recognize the guy who I'm going to say plays who he is. Um, born to be. Born to be. Okay. Born to be. Movie. Movie. All right. 2019 movie. Fairly recent. Um, it, oh, got a lot of awards. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's that's completely hasn't just <laughs> there's there's more than one born to be movie. So uh, okay, I'm gonna put the name in. What's his name? Uh, oh, here's a, here's some of the. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a different one. Uh, here we have some information. You can read that while I'm trying to find this out. Um, Baker. Let me let me get it correct because there's two more than one movie named Born to Be. Um, uh, Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke is in the movie. So in the 19, late 1960s, jazz trumpeter Chet Baker, who was played by Ethan Hawke, begins a romance with actress Carmen A. a Joko? Joko? Okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. While trying to stage a musical comeback. It looks really good. Um, so check it out. Um, I think that sounds like a nice movie. Um, so thank you for that recommendation. Um, Miriam says, all of Austin has been buzzing about a serial killer found the day. Nah, yeah. That, I already talked about that, Austin. That Lady Lake. I think it's Lady Lake. I already talked about that. And it, every one of them is like, as far as I can see, an accidental death. Yeah. But they, they've gone crazy about that. That is true. Um, <laughs> I remove all the throw rugs. <laughs> you know, then I'll just trip over the, 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 you know, you do the best you can to be careful. But every once in a while, just do some stupid crap. Uh, wait, wait, what is that? Oh no! I'm thinking of orange traffic cones. Um, no, they were they were those were solid cement, man. Um, Molly, great idea. Molly says, "Oh, you, <laughs> oh, Lady Bird Lake. That's the name of it, Lady Bird Lake." Um, Jackie said, "If he fell, if if he fell, he'd land below the window, but probably farther out if he jumped. Maybe." And again, I you know, there is that different different between the 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 um. Between the building, you're, you're correct. And then there's a sidewalk of some sort. And then there's these cones. And I'd have to look seriously at the crime scene photos. Uh, also have to determine whether, how much force he needed. Um, so some people will say he was like, they pushed him out the window, which would throw him further. Um, and if he jumped, yes, it would throw him further. But also in accidental deaths, um, sometimes people sit on the very edge. And then when they go to fall, they actually push themselves because they're falling and they kick. Now they, they start, they push on the, the window edge or whatever. It also pushes them out further. Depends how they fall. Did they tumble down this way or did they tumble straight over? I don't know, but I can't see any real reason why somebody else chucked them out the window and that there was any evidence of it. So it's one of those things. Okay. Let's see what else have we got here. Um, couple, just, um, Want to just bring this one up? I've got, got some really quick ones here, just for the fun of it. So anyway, this is a band teacher. This is a Texas teacher who teaches in the band. He crosses the country to meet up with a teen girl in Fairfax, Virginia, all from Texas to Fairfax, a fifteen hundred mile drive. And it wasn't a it wasn't a teen fourteen year old girl at all. It was a it was a trap, you know. 
you know, what a guy will do to have sex with a 14 year old. Hmm, lovely, huh? Just lovely. Um, that's just a quick one. Um, this, I want to talk about this just because the other day I was trying to find a place for, to eat sushi with my grand, my granddaughter. And there's a place called, uh, let me get the name of it straight. I should know this. I, I go by it all the time. It's right next to, um, uh, a location where I, it's right next to mom's health food place. Um, but it is, um, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Hold on a second. It's the name of the restaurant. What the heck? Ah, hold on a second. <laughs> it went messing on me. Okay, this, the restaurant, the only reason I want to talk about this is this restaurant is in the, in the Bowie, Maryland. And it, it has, um, sushi but it's also got other kinds of foods and it's got a bar there and it's kind of sort of semi-classy looking and that guy on the left was the bartender and the guy on the right it was the manager at the time the guy on the left got in some dispute and he shot the manager and the two own the two owners two co-owners who were uh asian uh, i believe they're chinese uh killed three people over some freaking dispute now you look at the guy on the left and you think he's your bartender and don't you think he looks like a really nice guy, attractive man, really seems like a nice guy. And then he kills off the manager and the two owners. For what reasons? And what really bothers me about this crime is that it got very little uh, anything in the newspapers. Now, the manager was not Marylander. He was from the South. And it's almost like, well, we don't care so much because he wasn't a Marylander. And the two Asian guys, Chinese guys, it's like, we don't care about them because they're Chinese. I don't know. It was, just, it was really weird that this, this incident came and went. And about, they had like a couple flowers outside this, this restaurant. And then like a week later, the restaurant reopened. I have never been able to set foot in that restaurant. And, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I just, I cannot make myself cross the line. To me, I see the three murdered people in there. And I think had... Had it been like a, some other situation where they were murdered and then you no know, nobody inside was responsible, like the bartender, like a, like an outside person. Um, and then they had enough grieving time and then reopened and said, we love our people. and has, But they just kind of like, it was almost like the crime never happened. It's just like, well, yeah, that was last week. And every time I see that place, I can't cross. I can't cross. I can't open their door. It's been, and I think it's happened like now it's, I, can't, I wish I found, lost my uh, thing on it, but it happened like probably, maybe it's uh, five, 10 years ago now. And so I'm like, oh, I want to get my daughter some sushi. No, not that place. And I just, I always drive by it. It creeps me out. And it's not because a homicide occurred there. It's because of the way they handled the homicide. That three people were brutally murdered by this whack job. And yet I can't hardly find anything about this crime. It's like, it just didn't, it's just like it came in and went out of the community. Like it didn't matter. And I don't understand it. It's, it just always left a bad taste in my mouth for respect for crime victims, respect for what happened, that something so egregious happened. We're not talking about drug dealers, you know, a couple of drug dealers getting a fight. You're like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, the manager, that was his, I think, first management job. And he was so excited to get it, to be a manager of a restaurant and he gets killed. And it's like, okay, never mind. I just, I don't get it. I, it was one of the weirdest things that this just vanished. Um, hold on a second. I just got to see what happened to my, uh, my art article on this. Um, just so I can tell you about it. Cause it just, it's one is, I think everybody's maybe has a, a crime and uh, let's see if I can find this buoy. Uh, uh, Blue Sunday, which Blue Sunday. Yes, that was murder. I'll put murders in Blue Sunday. A disgruntled bartender. Kills three co-workers inside a restaurant and later attempts suicide. Well, I didn't do it well. An alleged disgruntled bartender entered a buoy restaurant early Sunday morning and opened fire. Interestingly, it was on Sunday, Blue Sunday. That was actually the name of the restaurant. Opened fire, killing three of his co-workers. The carnage unfolded around 2.15 inside the Blue Sunday Bar and Grill and Hilltop North Shopping Center, which is a perfectly lovely area of Bowie, Maryland. I mean, we're not talking about, it's not a scummy area. This is a nice area. Um, a strip mall with stores, including 7-Eleven, Jersey Mike's, Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, a regular, regular thing. 
Uh, they identified the three victims, uh, Sherwood Morgan, 46 of Mitchellville. Um, I thought he was from the South. Okay. That's where I live, Mitchellville. <laughs> okay. Oops. Jin Shen, 27 of Laurel, and, and, and Zhu Zhao, I don't know how to pronounce his name, 28 also of Laurel. They say Morgan was one of the managers at the restaurant while Chen and Zhao were co-owners. I could never step foot in there, step, step foot in there again, a female bartender stated Sunday evening. She looked at the restaurant shop. I don't want to believe it really happened. No one deserved this. She couldn't go back and she, she had worked there. Um, uh, the, um, I thought Sherwood Morgan was from another area. I didn't realize he was from here. What the heck? I thought he was down in Georgia or something. Anyway, the killer was Carly Moye, 40 years old. Ongoing workplace, workplace conflict. Shooting was a pointless crime for sure it was. Um, he supposedly tried to commit him. He shot himself twice, but he survived. I don't know what ever happened to the dude. Um, Moye, the killer, um, was a quiet guy who'd wave his hand and say hello. He lived with a female relative and her teenage daughter. He liked to fix up cars and shoveled the sidewalk in front of elderly couples' home. They did po he did post an explicit me message on his Facebook page that people think said um, he was, what's the world coming to? F the world, don't ask for shit. So he was obviously pissed off at something. There was a makeshift memorial, and then like a freaking week later, it just reopened. And I've never set foot in there. So I'm just curious, do you, have you ever had a crime in your town which just is one of those things that just... You can't get past, you know, even me as a profile. I mean, I'm usually, I can walk on crime scenes everywhere, but that one place, I will never set foot in that restaurant. Never. I've tried to convince myself to do it. I'm like, hey, that happened a long time ago because it happened in, and why, why am I just, you know, holding it against the restaurant? <laughs> it happened in, um, well, it was 2017. So, okay, so it wasn't that long ago. It's six years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, Not so handsome. I don't know about that. Um, wait a minute. Uh, oh, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the the singer. Did he? Oh, did he get a life sentence? Well, he, well, he should have gotten a life sentence. Thank God. Um, but it's just that they say it's one of those weird crimes that just, yeah. Um, do I think the owner's ethnicity and culture is why they reopen so quickly? Well, the, the co-owners are dead. I'm not quite sure who reopened the place. Um, maybe. Maybe they just had a lot invested and had to keep going. I don't know. But it's just one of these things where it, it was the way it was handled. Like it was all just brushed under the rug so quickly. And it just, and I say it wasn't a case of a bunch of drug deals or anything. You're talking about good members of the community. It just, it was just this very bizarre, I can't even explain it. It was like. We just pretend it didn't happen, and then we'll just go and have sushi. <laughs> just you know, I can't pretend it didn't happen. So I don't. Know, maybe if I walked in the restaurant, they'd have a big plaque there with mem memoriam thing. I don't know. But somehow I just can't walk back in. Um, just can't. <laughs> By the way, biting my tongue. This is not a political channel. Thank you. It is not a political channel, and I think politics should be uh, discussed and 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 uh, because. It, and not in a mean way, but people should be able to discuss things and have reasonable conversations, reasonable conversations. But yes, this is not a political channel. So I thank you for not going there. <laughs> but I just, that was just one of these things that that, that crime always bothered me. And I, it came by and it just, it just bugged me. Um, now here's an, here's a little interesting one, which I just saw. Um, this is a weird one. Suspect claims self-defense in killing his roommate. Now this is also local. But, you know, you're, this is one of these things where you look at and you go, what's behind the story here? Um, the guy who got killed was, uh, where'd the dude go? Oh, come on. No, we're not doing the missing thing again, are we? Probably. <laughs> um, hold on a second. Why did I lose my, where, where'd it go? Uh, I, lose, I lost my picture, that's all. You know, I always lose pictures. I'm good at losing pictures. Let's see if I can find him. Oh, I think I accidentally knocked him off. All right. So this this fellow, come on, come out here. This fellow was killed by his roommate, the guy in the front. All right. 
Okay, that guy in the front was killed by his roommate. The roommate, this is this is an interesting story. A man accused of killing his roommate claims he shot him in self-defense. But police say he continued to shoot at the 27-year-old as he tried to run away. His story is this. Police were called to a townhouse in Springdale, Maryland, and it's a pretty, very decent community, uh, for a shooting. But they believe, okay, so they were called on Wednesday at 12.30 p.m., but they believe that the actual crime went down at 5.30 a.m. Previously, right? Scott's roommate, 38-year-old Richard Bernal, or something like that, told detectives he was asleep on the living room couch when his roommate woke him and repeatedly asked where the TV remote could be found. As you know, that is always a good reason for murder. You can't find a remote. Uh, he said, Bernal, Bernal said he removed the blanket covering his head. So this guy's sleeping. He goes like this. And he saw Scott Hayes holding two large knives. So he got his gun. He says Scott Hayes told him he wouldn't shoot and started to advance. But the other guy with a knife started to advance on him. So he shot him. Police found multiple bullet holes leading to Scott Hayes' bedroom. So Scott Hayes was running away at this point. He's still shooting, right? Now, you could think that this could be truly what happened because it was actually, they when they found Scott Hayes' body, they also, well, that's not it, sorry, this one. They found three large knives, one in each of his hands and a third in his pants, waistband, and a bottle of bleach, okay, and lots, lots of bullets. All right, so now the guy's on the floor, got a knife in each hand and a knife in his pants. Of course, we can all ask, were they there when the shooting went down or did the shooter go find some knives to stick them in his hands and then say, see, he came at me with knives. So anyway, after he shoots the guy, he says this. He told the detectives he went back to sleep <laughs> because that's what you do after you kill people, don't you? Just go back to sleep. <laughs> this is what this is what gets you put in prison for the rest of your life. Just letting you know. <laughs> he went back to sleep. He said he got up later, drove to a marijuana dispensary in D.C. and a tobacco shop in Landover. When he got home, he said he smoked marijuana and flushed the shell casings while contacting friends who urged him to call 911 because I guess you can't figure that out yourself because you're too busy sleeping and buying weed and smoking weed. And <laughs> so then they responded to his 911 call. They found Scott Hayes' body lit, fly, uh, face down in the bedroom, one knife in each hand and a third in his waistband, and found multiple fire bullets and a bottle of bleach, which he was obviously trying to clean up, but he got tired of doing it, so he went to sleep. The guy who did the killing was prohibited from owning a gun due to a prior criminal conviction. No kidding. You know what he was charged with? Manslaughter. Manslaughter. So are they buying the story that he was self? No, there's self-defense. There's manslaughter and there's murder. If this was not self-defense, how the hell does it turn into manslaughter? I have no clue why it's a manslaughter charge. In my opinion, it looks like murder one, um, that he wanted to kill his roommate. Now, maybe murder two because oh, because you weren't planning to kill him, although you did have a gun that you... Now, it, there is also the truth. And, then, and somebody said this when the family was discussing the victim. They made some comment how he was working to get his life together. So they began to wonder what the victim's issues were, whether he had psychological issues, uh, legal issues, was in a halfway house. So maybe the, 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 the roommate also had issues. So maybe that's where the police get confused. It's like, well, maybe the dude did really come out with some couple of knives. Maybe it's true because he's like wacko. This is what we don't know from the outside, but... I'm going to say when you when you shoot your roommate down, this is not the time to go to the marijuana dispensary. <laughs> it's just like, what? Oh, my God. Uh, if the guy was running away and shot in the back, it doesn't sound like self-defense. No, it doesn't. It really does not. Um, why, why do I find this completely believable? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think this guy's, listen, Jackie says, to too many crime podcasts to come up with that excuse. And he gets manslaughter, go figure. Sometimes things are just like, you know, you just kind of scratch your head and you're like, yeah, I don't know about this one. Um, uh, what was one of these other ones I really wanted to, oh, where is it, where is it, where is it? 
Oh, got to do Latavia. Okay. Um, if that does disturb one's sleep. Um, he knew he would never get the chance to burn one again. No, no, he's going to prison. He'll get a lot of chance to do drugs. We know drugs are in prison. Let me talk about Latavia. Now, I don't know if you remember this crime, and I spoke up strongly about this crime. This was the woman who went to Mexico, to Matamoros, Mexico, to get a tummy tuck. Now, mind you, she had like a crap load of kids, and she'd had a tummy, like, tummy tuck before, supposedly. But let's face it, that tummy tuck wasn't going to do a lot for her. Um, but supposedly, she was going to Mexico to get a tummy tuck. And she took like three male friends with her, as one does. And they rent, they rent a van. And three male friends and a female friend, they rent a van, on, supposedly going on like um, a fun outing from North Carolina, I think in North Carolina, to Mexico to get a tummy tuck. I'm like, don't you just usually fly in and fly back out? I mean, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, if you want to take a girlfriend with you, both of you can fly in and share a room together. But the story was so suspect. So anyway, they got kidnapped. They got kidnapped in Mexico, and two of them ended up shot to death. Uh, they were actually kidnapped. There's no question about that. Um, that that they had um, they had been kidnapped for quite. A, they were the whole. There's a whole deal that went down where they were finally the cartel said they had kidnapped them and they let them go. Who was still alive, which was her and one other guy. Um, but the story stays in the papers. The story had been that she went for a tummy tuck because it was cheaper down there and got lost on the way to the medical clinic and um, got mistaken for drug dealers or drug buyers or whatever. And that's why they all got kidnapped. They were, you can, there's actually a video of it. You can see them being put in the back of a truck and taken away. And two of them got, got killed and she survived. And one of the guys survived. And everybody's like, oh my God, Mexico is so dangerous. These poor people. She only went down for a tummy tuck. And I'm looking at this crime going, I don't buy, I don't not buy she was going for a tummy tuck. I couldn't make sense of the whole methodology of her going for this tummy tuck. Um, and also the fact that when you get certain things done, what she would have to get done, she might have been there for like a week. And so who's paying for this week long time down there and all kinds of issues. And um, if I can find my, I think I did a whole, I think I did a whole video on this. I'll link that one below. I'm not going to get into the whole details of it because I'm, short on time. But I've always said, no, this woman's involved in drug trade. As far as I can see, I think they were down there making a drug deal. And they're using the tummy tuck thing as a reason to go to the border town of Matamoros. I just don't buy this. I just don't buy this. There's a lot of people who go to Mexico and get work done. A lot of dental work is done down there. Uh, people cross over for, for, for medications. Um, and yes, is some of the border towns aren't that safe, but generally speaking, you, you go down during the day, you do your bit and you leave. I mean, what the heck? So this, this, and I, there were some issues about her background, but this, I just saw, cause I've been looking for any newer stuff on this case. Uh, North Carolina beat this story comes in is learning more about Latavia Washington McGee's trip to Matamoros, Mexico for an alleged tummy tuck before she and three of her friends were kidnapped by the cartels. Latavia Washington McGee is no stranger to the world, having gained viral attention after being kidnapped in March of this year. Three of her friends accompanied her on a trip. I think it's actually, I thought it was four. I thought it was three guys and a girl, but anyway, the girl stayed back in Texas and she didn't come across the board. Kidnapped in March of this year. They were kidnapped. There's no question about that. Three of her friends accompanied her on the trip from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Oh, South Carolina. Okay. Uh, to Matamoros, Mexico, where she intended to undergo a tummy tuck procedure. At least that's the claim. However, sources have been in contact with the North Carolina beat and said that Latavia was going to Mexico to establish a drug to, to establish drug connections on behalf of her husband, Tamario McGee. He is currently serving a 10 year sentence for trafficking dangerous drugs in Harry County, South Carolina. Um, in January, Tamario pleaded guilty to second-degree trafficking of methamphetamines and second-degree distribution of methamphetamines, according to uh, whatever an assistant solicitor down there. Tamario's initial arrest, the police apprehended him and three others at the Ocean Crest Inn and Suites. Uh, they seized one gram of heroin, 31 grams of methamphetamine, as well as roxycodone and Xanax pills. Sources tell the North Carolina beat 
that McGee's alleged trip for a tummy tuck was a, quote, drug deal gone wrong. And when you think about it, what woman would take a group of men with her to get a tummy tuck? Seriously, though? <laughs> this is very true. Just it, it, The whole thing stunk. It made no sense. Now, they also say that Tamara allegedly sells drugs in prison. He needed Latavia to bring the drugs back so he, they could be sneaked into the Kirkland Correctional Institution. Remember, I told you, you can get drugs in prison. Uh, however, it seems they messed up. If you recall, one of the women on the trip, there was a woman on the trip. She's the one to stay back in Texas. She reported that the four friends were missing. According to the police report, she told the police that she believed they were arrested because they like to do narcotics. <laughs> so the, <laughs> this is the first time I've seen that the friend ratted them out as being drug, basically drug dealers. Tamara and Latavia have been reported dating for 10 years and married almost three years ago. Latavia in 2016 was charged with child neglect after drugs were found in her children's systems. Hmm, yeah, she's, she's a great person. Um, <laughs> it's just like the whole thing was such a, the story just, I've spent time in Mexico and the whole story just stunk. And, you know, when it was reported in the media, it was reported as a horrible Mexican crime. The innocent these innocent Americans just going down there because a poor woman had too many babies and just wanted a flatter stomach. She just went down there with, you know, just hoping to come back looking better. And then she and her friends were kidnapped and how horrible all this was. And I'm just going, I just don't buy it. I don't buy it. I know how things work. I don't buy that one. And it's like, you know, and the fact is the, the, the regular media across the board reported this as a, these were innocent people. And I just kept thinking they're not innocent. And uh, most of them would not put the drug, the drug issues of the, everybody involved was involved in drugs. They all had long drug, drug, uh, sub, drugs. They're, they're drug dealers. All of them were drug dealers and have long criminal histories. And yet that was all tried. They tried to tone all that down to make it sound like these were just some innocent people. Now there are innocent people who will get killed in another country, but these weren't them. <laughs> these were not them. Um, so I thought that was a uh, just interesting to find. Um, is meth really a destination for meth though, or pills? I guess it was. Because you know, it, th yes, they do. They oh yeah, they sell a lot of meth. Are you kidding? Me? Border the border towns, the cartels do work. They bring the stuff into the country, but there's also a way that yeah, you can you can hook up with them down there, and you can get the product you need um, at a cheaper price because you don't have a middleman involved and all the other stuff. So yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't say, um, uh, wait a minute. I call BS. I get down to work on the other side. You never go if you don't have a local escort. Uh, I'm, I'll talk about this. A lot of times people go down to the border, uh, border, border city, and then they have a whole um, thing set up where they come, uh, uh, they come and get you on the American side. They drive you over to the clinic. You get the work done and they drive you back. There are a lot of people who do that. Um, there are some people who do it without an escort. That would probably be me. I spent, I, and I spent a lot of time in Mexico, so I'm comfortable in Mexico. I, I could jump a bus and, and I walk around Matamoros without worrying. Um, but most Americans don't do that. Uh, that's true. They don't. Uh, they usually go through a, they, they go through some kind of setup uh, so that they, you know, because most people are afraid to roll around in a, in a border town they don't know how how things work and i've never been in mexico and they get kind of freaky my sister has done my sister has actually done 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 the dental thing and that's exactly what they did picked her up and bring her in it's really you know, nice and they don't get the extra fun of enjoying the town which i would do i would i'd be going out to dinner and enjoying the parks and stuff so i would go by myself but but yeah <laughs> pleaded guilty to first degree for stupidity <laughs> oh my goodness um didn't think it would be dangerous to go. It isn't necessarily dangerous. It's just if you're just un, 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 uncomfortable, uncomfortable crossing the border and you're not familiar, you don't speak Spanish, you feel just, you know, but the border towns aren't as nice. Let's be, let's be straight. You know, if you go to Mexico City and you go to, oh, there's just so many towns and cities in Mexico. They're just absolutely lovely. Border towns are a little shadier. Our border towns are shadier, you know, so it's just because. You know, it's one of those places, too many tourists roll across the borders in this crap that goes on. But the best thing is, you know, I, I never forgot going to Tijuana, Mexico for the first time. I mean, I never knew they had zebras. There were zebras walking down the street there. It was just so amazing. 
of course, our horse is painted black and white with stripes. <laughs> but I'm like, zebras, fake zebras. It was kind of cool. Um, one more thing I want to talk about, uh, just to speak of Mexico, because this one kind of made me laugh. Um, uh, there were these armed robberies. This is in my area as well. Um, a 24-year-old Hyattsville man, this is Hyattsville, Maryland, has been arrested in connection um, with a a string of recent armed robberies targeting independent taxi service drivers uh, in the local area. Um, now, normal, you know, so somebody's attacking the taxi drivers. Now, I don't know if, how that's happening. When I say independent, I'm thinking the independent taxi drivers are accepting cash more, you know, more so than the companies. I mean, Uber, it's all, you know, uh, all credit card now. Uh, you can get some tips in cash and. I've heard that, you know, the Uber drivers prefer you to give them cash and tips. And if you don't give them cash, the tip in cash, they can grade you down as a, as a, as a passenger. I, I personally, I put it all on my credit card and they don't like it as much as if they get in cash. That's a big weird issue, but so they may have cash, but I'm thinking these are independent taxi drivers, meaning that <laughs> probably not even legal taxis, but anyway, they're running around. A preliminary investigation indicates that Francisco Chavez Ramirez called each of the taxi service drivers pretending to be a customer requesting a ride. Now, he's Hispanic. I'm pretty sure that the drivers were also Hispanic. Uh, once inside their vehicles, he pulled out a weapon and demanded money and property. In one case, Chavez Ramirez hit the driver and forced them to drive to an ATM to take out more money. That's what the, the police said. That just cracked me up because one of the things we're talking about Mexico is that when you go to Mexico City, they warn you about the taxis because, and it's also true in Nicaragua. If you get in a just a taxi, just you know, wave it down, you get in that taxi. The concern is a taxi driver will take you to, a, they will kidnap you and take you to the ATM, make you withdraw money, and go from ATM to ATM. That's kind of a that's kind of a thing that's happened down there, and that's kind of funny. Now we have the reverse. We have a guy here <laughs> who is making the taxi drivers go to the ATM. <laughs> So sometimes we talk about cultural crimes and the, the ATM uh, kidnapping your passenger to take them to ATM is a kind of a Mexican crime. At least it was. And then I say it spread into other parts of Central America, but also because we have a lot of people who moved here from those locations. They bring that kind of a crime with them because that's what happens in their country. And if Americans go someplace, we can bring American style crime as well. So I thought this was an interesting twist though. So we still have the same kind of crime, but now the taxi driver is the victim. It's like, I've never seen that before. It's like, you know, wow, that's, that's just, just kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> wait a minute, I'm sticking with, Bali says, I'm sticking with our local dentist, Dr. Pullum. Our entire town is toothless, but safe. <laughs> you know, my, Dennis, when I was a child, his name was Dr. Del Tufo. I mean, really? Really? Jesus. <laughs> Must eat a lot of soup. <laughs> oh, Tampico. You, yeah, I want to drive to Tampico to visit my aunt on the Gulf Coast. Yes, I've been to Tampico, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, I had a very interesting experience in Tampico with my son because we've come from Mexico City. Was it, was it Tampico? I think it was. And um, we like we like rode all day long and we got there. It was really late at night. And we decided to go out and eat and we were so tired. And um, so we got our room and our room was an inside room with no windows in it. And so we both went to sleep and, and then we both like woke up at like three o'clock, two or three o'clock. And then, and we're like, we're both awake. And we're like, why are we so awake? Cause we just went to bed a couple hours ago. <laughs> Turned out it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. We've been sleeping for like 14 hours straight. <laughs> It was that dark in the room. It was like a tomb because there were no windows and there was just no light in the room. I guess we were tired anyway, but it's like we were so pissed because we were planning to go to sleep and get up and spend the entire day in Tampico and enjoy ourselves. But we already ruined the whole day. So we, we, we had to leave. So that was our very bizarre Tampico experience. But yeah, you should do that. That, that would be fun. Um, yeah, definitely do that. Uh, let's see. I've got exactly six minutes left. Uh, somebody asked me, okay, so I will do the last thing and, and I can do it in six minutes because I really don't have as much to say as I know somebody would like me to say. Um, and this is the case of the um, uh, 
and I've had this request over and over again. There's, there's so little I can do with it. And that's why I can't possibly do a whole show on it. And this is the, uh, the Velis, I don't know how to pronounce it, Velisca, Iowa ax murders. And in 1912, a family of six and a couple of kids who were staying overnight, all eight of them were brutally murdered in their home in the middle of the night by, with an ax. Some guy took an ax out of the backyard, came in and went up to the parents' room first. It was higher up and had the, uh, not the, not the blade end. So he took the back end, you know, the other side and whacked them in the head. Um, so there was actually not like, you know, the, if you had the blade end, it would get stuck. And there's also more blood spatter. It took those, it basically was bludgeoning them, bludgeoned all eight of them to death. And then he covered them up with their clothing. So their faces were covered. And then he covered up the mirrors in the house and then vanished. And they never figured out exactly who did it. There was a, a belief that there was this creepy uh, uh, evang evangelist in town who had some really weird behaviors and they thought it was him. Then they thought it was somebody who, you know, was, had a grudge against them. Then they thought it was a serial killer who committed some other similar type crimes where they were, people were bludgeoned with axes. Um, I honestly don't know. And the reason I won't take these crimes and go into deep dives on them is because I just, all the information is so sketchy. I can't follow any of the information. So it's like, I could just, just, just say, well, it could be this guy. It could be this guy. It could be this guy. Cause I don't, don't, don't know. But one thing I want to point out, it reminds me, you know, when you take a look at um, um, uh, Lizzie Borden, the use of axes, and this is the only thing I think is really important about this. The use of axes was quite common in a great number of murders. And the problem we have a lot of times is when we want to link crimes together, we want to link them by weapons. Like, did the person strangle? Did the person stab? Did the person use a gun? Or did a person use an ax? Axes are not popular anymore. People don't, they don't chop firewood. I mean, you know, we don't chop firewood anymore. We don't have axes lying around. But in those days, if you wanted to be warm in the winter, 100 years ago, you were chopping a whole pack of, whole pile of wood, unless you were in the city and had it delivered. You used, and even if you had it delivered, because Lizzie Borden had it, it was, that she wasn't going out and chopping trees down. But she chopped, there were, there were people who chopped the wood that was even delivered. So axes were a big part of regular life. They were an available weapon. So, and they were very useful weapons. I mean, it's really easy to, you know, I mean, they're, they're good. You can use one side or the other. You can chop them up with a blade like Lizzie, or you can flip it over and, and bludgeon them to death. It's very useful. And since everybody had it, now this, one of the theories on the serial homicides that there's a serial killer was that the person who did this just used the, just went in the backyard and picked up the ax that was already there. He didn't bring his own ax. You know why? Because he didn't need to, because the ax was already there. I mean, why, do, why bring a weapon if you can use what's available? Now, in a recent one I just did on uh, the Dardeen uh, family murders, which I will put that, uh, I'll put that up publicly in a, a day or two. Um, but you've already seen it if you've gone, you know, come through Patreon. Um, Tommy Lynn Sells, who may have committed the crimes, tend sometimes used knives from the person's kitchen. Why? Because everybody's got knives in their kitchens. I mean, if you want a, a, a nice big knife, just, just you know, you got the knife block there, you just go, I'll take this one. <laughs> you know, you don't have to bring a knife to get rid of the knife. You just got to make sure you don't leave your fingerprints on the knife. But then you don't have to get rid of it. You don't have to buy it someplace because think about it. You know, when you go buy a knife, like uh, I think one of the problems we have with the, the Idaho murders, why he's in trouble, Koberger, is because the knife was one he bought. The sheath was something he brought. It wasn't something from the house. So then you can connect the previous behavior, whether the person went someplace and bought it in a store or bought it on Amazon or whatever they did they you could connect it to them and then if they take it with them they got to get rid of the stupid thing so now a lot of times it's not that hard you can throw it down a grate throw it you know throw it in a lake whatever but sometimes they find the weapon um but if you use somebody's weapon the knife that's already in the house or the axe that's just sitting outside sticking out of a tree stump where they cut wood just grab that sucker you don't need to bring your own 
you know, if you're going to and from the scene, carrying an axe is kind of noticeable sometimes. Well, what's under his coat? You know, <laughs> just use the axe that's there. But so we have an excess of axe killings during a period of time. But that's just because there's a whole lot of axes around in people's houses. So can I connect these different crimes as a serial killer crime because an axe was used? And the answer is I can't exactly do that because of the availability of axes at people's homes. Could be a serial killer. Absolutely could be. Uh, more comes down to the question is why the people were murdered um, and why is somebody running around killing people with axes. Um, and, you know, the, the, then we get into cultural issues uh, that I talk about that during different periods of time, people have very different behaviors and and even even the the criminal behaviors can be very different and the psychological conditions can be extremely different. Um, when I was talking about folie a deux with um, the Gypsy Rose Blanchard and uh, and Nick crime, um, I, that one of the questions is it's a folie a deux thing where she had this uh, basically uh, she had in her head that your mother needed to die and he got it got into his head that he had to do it with her and there's a number of crimes that are like this where you have two people who end up committing a crime together who may not have committed a crime if they hadn't been together but maybe one of them followed the others that other ones quote delusions now if you look at the original meaning of folie de it truly meant psychotic delusions and not just ideas or our our psychopathy it really meant big delusions, like the person was seeing things that weren't there. They thought that cats were attacking them. And then the other person got in with the cats attacking them. I mean, it was originally a very, very psychotic duo thing. Two people caught up in psychotic delusion. And, and that's not so popular anymore, but it was super popular. If you jump, jump back a hundred years, you go, especially in Europe and stuff, you hear about all these psychotic delusions people were having, really bizarre stuff. And um, you think, what the heck? I don't know, something in their food back then or in their alcohol or in their drugs or in their lifestyles. I don't know. But when you go to different periods of time, it's fascinating that you have very different types of crimes. So the villain, uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, the uh, the Velisca, uh axe murders. I don't know that I could come to a conclusion on it. All I can say is axes were very useful tools and everybody had them. <laughs> and you didn't have to bring your own weapon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see, um, far, oh, Fargo. <laughs> yeah, that's a wood chipper. That's a wood chipper. Okay. I got to head out. I had to be out of here at 145. It's 147. I cannot be late. Are they going to be really, they're, they're very strict, super strict. So I'm going to race out the door now. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what time I'm going to be doing the the earlier show um, every other week. I do seven o'clock uh, every every other week, and then I usually do three o'clock in the afternoon every other week, so I can help people who are like in the UK who would like to see the shows, and then in Europe, uh, and then in the evening, you know, I get people, the UK falls asleep unless they're insomniacs, and people in the US are more likely to be there, and also people from New Zealand and Australia, so. I keep trying to vary the time, but so I started this singing thing and I have to figure out whether I'm going to just move to Wednesday for the uh, three o'clock show, which I might do. So I don't know. We'll find out. But anyway, thank you guys for being here. <laughs> and I'm going out. Van oh, the Vanishing Triangle. Yes, I'm going to look that up. I, I did see that in my um, the Irish is Ireland. Yeah, Ireland. I'm, I'm doing my click here. Uh, Ireland. Yes, I will check that out and see whether that might be something I do want to do. Um, so anyway, again, thank you for being here. I'm going to race out the door and hopefully my car will get out of the snow and won't be icy. I don't know. Uh, my granddaughter, my granddaughter got all the snow off my car, but I'm not sure she did a good job. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for being here and I will see you this weekend for whatever show I decide to do for the, for the actual case show, which I haven't made up my mind. So Saturday or Sunday, probably Sunday. Um, uh, I'll let you know and I'll send you the uh, link over. And if you're on Patreon, you get to see the show without advertising before it goes public. And if you don't want to be on Patreon, you get stuck with the advertising, but that helps support the channel as well. So whatever supports the channel, I'm for. <laughs> see, you guys, see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>